December 10th and December 17th for Pfizer and Moderna, respectively. About six weeks ago, October 21st, Dr. Azike and I presented to you Illinois' framework for distributing vaccines in line with the CDC's recommendations. We walked through with you the unknowns about the vaccines, things like how many doses would each person need and what the storage requirements would likely be. The FDA has since provided more information that fill in the unknowns, although they're still in the process of evaluating the vaccine candidates to ensure the utmost safety and efficacy. We now know that first up in the FDA's review will be the Pfizer vaccine, which recorded an incredible 95% effective rate across a trial of 43,000 participants. This vaccine requires two doses given three weeks apart and requires extremely cold storage. It must be kept at minus 70 degrees Celsius in a specialized freezer that shouldn't be opened more than twice a day and only for about one minute at a time. Once thawed, it can be kept at a more typical refrigeration temperature for about five days. Then there's the Moderna candidate. Similar to Pfizer's, Moderna's vaccine saw 94% effectiveness across 30,000 trial participants. Moderna also requires two doses administered four weeks apart. In terms of storage, the Moderna vaccine requires only a standard freezer temperature for up to six months and can be refrigerated for 30 days and left at room temperature for up to 12 hours. And multiple other vaccine candidates, like those from AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, are in their final stages of evaluation. I've said it before and I'll say it again, Illinois will only distribute a vaccine that is deemed safe. In addition to the thorough review at the FDA, Illinois is one of many states that have established additional review panels, including Indiana, California, New York, West Virginia, and Michigan. There's an all hands on deck effort to ensure the most thorough evaluation possible. But all signs to date are astoundingly promising. Never before have we seen uh, an early vaccine study, like the studies that have come out for these vaccines, of this scale that have demonstrated such high levels of protection. The CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, an esteemed group of public health and medical professionals, has provided an initial set of recommendations on who should receive the first round of available vaccines. Their focus initially is on the nation's 21 million healthcare workers and 3 million long-term care residents. This is phase 1A of vaccine distribution. The goal here is to fortify the healthcare workforce by removing these uh, most exposed workers from the cycle of quarantine, illness, and infection, as well as protecting our most vulnerable residents. Nationally, long-term care facility residents represent 6% of known COVID-19 cases, but 40% of known COVID-19 deaths. In Illinois, we have 655,000 people who qualify as frontline healthcare workers. That breaks down to about 162,000 in Chicago and 493,000 outside of Chicago. And I'm making that clear because the federal government has decided to deliver to the nation's largest cities, places like Chicago and Los Angeles and New York City, a separate direct supply of the vaccine. We also have about 110,000 adults statewide who live in congregate settings, like long-term care facilities or assisted living residences, approximately 16,000 of whom live in Chicago. The city of Chicago's distribution will operate in tandem with the rest of the state, and we're in communication with city officials as they work to distribute the allocation that they get directly. If the Pfizer vaccine receives federal approval on December 10th, 
We've been informed that Illinois is currently slated to get 109,000 doses of the vaccine sometime during the week after next. That breaks down to 23,000 to the city of Chicago directly and 86,000 to the rest of the state of Illinois. There will be shipments of more and more vaccine each week following that first shipment's arrival. So although the numbers now may seem relatively small in comparison to our population, those numbers will increase over the subsequent weeks and months. In Illinois, to implement the recommendations of ACIP and the CDC, the very first vaccinations will be dedicated to hospitals and healthcare workers in the 50 counties with the highest death rates per capita. And in just a moment, Dr. Ezekiel will dive into the details of that distribution model and how we're assisting local health departments across the state through this process. Some quick math will tell you that it's going to take multiple weeks of distribution to even get our healthcare workers their first of the two doses that they require, while also getting to the long-term care facility residents. But remember, nationally, those two groups equal about 24 million people. ACIP has prioritized not only healthcare workers and long-term care residents, but also frontline what they're calling essential workers, including first responders, all those older than age 65, and those who have multiple comorbidities or high-risk medical conditions. And ACIP is expected to soon offer further guidance on the order of those groups after Phase 1A. Manufacturing, distribution, and administering enough vaccine to cover these prioritized candidates will take some time, more than just the next few weeks. We also know that for many reasons, black and brown Americans have disproportionately suffered deaths from COVID-19 in their communities. ACIP is currently considering specific allocations of the vaccine before expanding to the remainder of the population. And Illinois will account for their expert recommendation in the next tiers of distribution with a focused eye on equity. In other words, this will not be a quick process. With the two-dose timeline, no single person will be fully vaccinated even by Christmas, and it will likely be uh, months before people with low risk factors for COVID-19 see their first dose. Uh, but the very fact that we have this timeline is the result of incredible private sector innovation and longstanding public investment in scientific research. The research capability and technology and good old fashioned American ingenuity that has helped develop these vaccines is truly something that we all should be proud of. I know that for some people the same extraordinary timeline that speaks to the power of science may also lend itself to some hesitations. But while these COVID-19 vaccine break, are breaking records in their development speed, I want to make clear to everyone that these researchers didn't start from scratch. BioNTech, the German counterpart to Pfizer in the first vaccine, was founded over a decade ago specifically to study R, sorry, mRNA technology, the foundation of the Pfizer vaccine. Unlike many standard vaccines, mRNA vaccines don't require any deactivated version of the virus they prevent to produce. That's a breakthrough that allows vaccines to be produced efficiently and affordably in a lab at a much faster rate than in years past. Nearly a year ago, in early January, the University of Sydney professor uploaded the genetic sequence of this virus as identified by Yong Zhen Zhang of the Shanghai Public Health Clinical Center and School of Public Health uh, before the virus even had a name. That allowed scientists here in the U.S. and around the world to immediately dive into the work of developing treatments and vaccines to beat the disease that came to be known a little bit later as COVID-19. But years before that, researchers at the National Institutes of Health here in the United States were making major strides in evaluating spike proteins 
in other kinds of coronaviruses, laying the groundwork for these new COVID-19 vaccines and allowing companies like Pfizer and Moderna to move as fast as they have. It's a true testament to the necessity of continuously investing in science to move us forward. Government investments in science are important, and those investments have consistently paid enormous dividends as they are with these new vaccines. We are on the precipice of the first vaccinations, just a year after this virus was first detected, is a true testament to the quality of researchers and epidemiologists and infectious disease doctors that we have. They deserve our gratitude and our respect and now it's on all of us to keep wearing our masks, keep our distance, and find the patience to allow the vaccines to be distributed so that we can put this difficult chapter in the history books. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ezeke, who will discuss some of the logistics involved in delivering the first round of the vaccines. Doctor. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, as the Governor mentioned, I will dive into the mechanics of the COVID-19 vaccine distribution for the state of Illinois. As things have changed, we were initially told that Illinois would receive approximately 400,000 doses of vaccine in our first shipment, but as the Governor has mentioned, that has been reduced to approximately 109,000, and we still know that we need to wait for final numbers as we get closer to the date. Regardless of how many doses we do receive, IDPH will be tracking shipments, allocations, and the data to detect any disparities in administration. The initial shipment of COVID-19 vaccines will be received by IDPH directly from the CDC and stored in our strategic national stockpile. Uh, we have purchased 20 ultra-cold freezers for the vaccines that will require uh, this special housing. Allocation of these vaccines will be sent initially to the 50 counties, as uh, Governor Pritzker mentioned, that have the highest death rate per capita. IDPH has already notified the hospitals, the 10 hospitals of the regional hospital coordination centers that will serve as the distribution site for the vaccine to the local health departments of those 50 counties. Our local health department partners will then work with the hospitals in their area to identify the high risk and the critical health care workers for the initial vaccine administration. Also, there is a federal partnership with both CVS and Walgreens pharmacies to directly vaccinate residents of the long-term care facilities. In our state, all but five of the long-term care facilities have registered to participate in this process, and we'll continue to work to make sure we get those last five facilities registered as well. Once there are more doses of the vaccine uh, from Moderna and maybe other uh, vaccine candidates that are in the pipeline, you know, <clears throat> we will have we will continue to vaccinate people in the phase 1A and the subsequent phase 1B. After those individuals are vaccinated, uh, there will be more, hopefully, vaccine available and more healthcare providers in Illinois will be able to enter their vaccine orders in our registry system and IDPH will be able to also place orders on the provider's behalf. iCare is our uh, Illinois Comprehensive Automated Immunization Registry Exchange and this is a web-based immunization record sharing application. The application allows both public and private healthcare providers to share immunization records of Illinois residents with other physicians and public health officials statewide. IDPH staff will then submit orders to CDC and depending on whether the ultra cold or the simply refrigerated vaccine is sent, IDPH or the providers themselves will directly receive those doses to then be administered. Uh, this process will continue until hopefully everyone in Illinois is vaccinated. Uh, I will put the caveat that at this point we know that this vaccine might be for 18 and over until we hear otherwise. So there are still many moving parts uh, to the plan, but as we have been, hopefully you appreciate since the beginning of this pandemic, we will share information as we get it, uh, fully transparent and be responsive to your questions and your inquiries to get you the information that you need. 
Today, IDPH reports 10,526 new cases of COVID-19 for a total of 770,088 cases as a total for the state of Illinois. Unfortunately, over the last 24 hours, we received a report of another 148 lives lost for a total of 12,974 individuals lost to COVID. Overnight, 5,453 individuals were in the hospital with COVID-19, and of those, 1,153 1, individuals were in the ICU, and 703 patients were on ventilators. In the last 24 hours, more than 112,000 tests had been reported for a total of almost 11 million tests in the state of Illinois. Of course, each day that passes brings us closer to getting back to our normal. Uh, that's kind of cliche, of course, that's the truth, but that day will come sooner as we continue to maintain our mitigation efforts, continue to wash up, back up, uh, uh, and mask up, of course, and then please, if you haven't, sleeve up in order to receive your flu shot, which is available at your providers today. Thank you, and now I will translate comments into Spanish. Buenas tardes a todos. Feliz viernes. Como mencionó el gobernador, hablaré de la distribución de la vacuna de COVID-19 aquí en Illinois. Hemos recibido diferentes cantidades de vacunas para nosotros para nuestro estado del CDC, pero cualquier la cantidad que recibimos, el IDPH va a seguir los envíos, las asignaciones y los datos para detectar disparidades. El IDPH recibirá el envío inicial, inicial, inicial de vacunas de COVID-19 directamente del CDC y lo almacenará en nuestra Reserva Nacional Estratégica. Hemos comprado 20 ultra congeladores para las vacunas que los quieren, requieren. La asignación de estas vacunas se enviará a los 50 condados con la tasa de mortalidad más alta por cápita. IDPH ha notificado los hospitales del Centro de Coordinación Hospitalaria Regional para servir como sitios para distribuir la vacuna a los departamentos de salud locales en los 50 condados. Nuestros socios del departamento de salud local trabajaron con hospitales en su área para identificar a los trabajadores médicos esenciales y de alto riesgo para la administración de vacunas. También hay una asociación federal con las farmacias CVS y también Walgreens para proveer la vacuna directamente de, en las instituciones de cuidados médicos de largo plazo. Todas las instituciones, excepto cinco, se han registrado para este proceso y continuamos trabajando con las que faltan, esos cinco. Una vez que haya más dosis de la vacuna de COVID-19 disponibles y gente de la fase 1A y 1B estén vacunadas, los proveedores de atención médica de Illinois van a ordenar sus vacunas por iCare. iCare es uh, el uh, registro de las uh, inmunizaciones. Eh, es una aplicación de intercambio de registros de vacunación basada en, el, en la web. La aplicación permite a los proveedores de atención médica públicos y privados compartir los registros de vacunación de los residentes de Illinois con otros médicos y funcionarios de salud pública en todo el estado. El personal, <coughs> me, el personal de IDPH luego enviará los órdenes al CDC y dependiendo de si uh, enviar la vacuna ultra fría o refrigerada, IDPH o los propios proveedores recibirán sus dosis para su administración. Este proceso continuará hasta que con suerte todos en Illinois estén vacunados. Hay muchas partes de este plan, pero como hemos sido desde el comienzo de esta pandemia, Seremos transparentes con ustedes, la gente de Illinois, que están luchando juntos para llegar a este punto. Hay también 
necesito reportar los números. Hoy, IDPH reporta 10,526 nuevas infecciones de COVID-19 para un total de 770,088 casos en Illinois. Tristemente, esto incluye un reporte de 148 vidas perdidas para un total de 12,974 muertes aquí en Illinois. Los hospitales reportan que hubo 5,453 personas internadas con COVID-19 y entre ellas, 1,153 pacientes estaban en la unidad de cuidados intensivos y 7, 703 pacientes estaban en ventiladores. En las últimas 24 horas se llevaron a cabo más de 112 mil pruebas para un total de más de 11 millones de pruebas de COVID-19 en Illinois. Cada día que pasa nos acerca un paso más a la normalidad, pero no debemos dejar en nuestras acciones de mitigación. Sigue practicando los tres M's. Usa su máscara, mantenga su distancia y lávense las manos. Y todavía hay tiempo si no han hecho para vacunarse contra la influenza. Muchas gracias para su apoyo. And with that, I will turn it over to Governor Pritzker. Thanks very much, Dr. TK. Happy to take questions from members yes, of the Governor media. Pritzker, would you yes. be willing to take, get the vaccine shot here during one of your 2.30 daily briefings? Just to show, oh sure, I, but not ahead people? of it, but not ahead of anybody else who you know who, according to the ACIP guidelines, uh, you know should get their vaccine. But I'd be happy to uh, demonstrate to people that I would take the vaccine, uh, as I think any public official should. But they should do it in line with whatever their comorbidities or wherever they fit. If they're a healthcare worker, in addition to being elected official, etc. And are you making the vaccine mm -hmm. mandatory for frontline workers? No. Uh, we are, are though, we, no, but shots. we are, we are um, sending it to the hospital specifically for the purpose of them distributing it to their personnel. Um, it is up to them to have their personnel line up and get the vaccine shots. Have there been trials at any, I mean, are you, are, are there sort of doing some practices because of, mm -hmm. I've heard that there's sort of the time limit when you open the vial that you must administer it rather quickly? Um, I think the what you're really referring to, uh, if I may, um, is um, uh, when it gets to a rural community, for example, we're talking about the ultra cold, just to be clear. I think it's the ultra cold storage requirement that is the, the thing that people are concerned about. And as Dr. Zike has talked about, and I have too, uh, you know, there are days uh, from the time that it, it comes out of ultra cold storage to the time that it has to be injected in somebody's arm, five days, as I understand. And uh, so we want to make sure that the counties, as they're picking up their allocations, uh, have a plan for distributing the proper number. By the way, these regional healthcare centers that are holding on to uh, the vaccine for them in ultra cold storage, which we've enhanced their capabilities, I might add, at the state level to those hospitals. Um, but we've allowed them to keep in the local county governments, public health departments, to keep their vaccines in cold storage until they need them and want to distribute them. So they don't need to take them all and then have to worry about whether there's going to be spoilage. Uh, they do only want to take out of uh, the ultra cold freezers, though, what they will use. Why were those 10 hospitals chosen? I'm assuming it's geography, but also they have the storage. There's a hit, they do have the storage, but they also, there's a history of IDPH working with these major medical centers across the state. These are the regional hubs that IDPH has worked with historically. Is there anything you want to add to that? I mean, that's, that's, that is how this has been broken out for many years in the state, and it does cover the territory if you look at the map as we've uh, put it out. And how critical is the second dose, and, and how are you going to keep, how are the providers and the state can keep on top of people getting that second dose in a fashion? Well, there's, you know, the providers certainly have uh, some responsibility here, right, as they're injecting people to make sure that they know what the next appointment is for them to come back. And then it's up to individuals too, right? You can't force somebody to show up, um, but you, I think everybody will want to. Uh, and so I, I, you know, there's going to be a reminder system, I'm sure, by providers to their patients as they're administering the first dose. 
Uh, you have to have the second dose from the same provider that you got the, sorry, from the same manufacturer as you did the first dose. So if you got the Pfizer vaccine uh, on dose one, you want to get the Pfizer vaccine on dose two. Can you give us any further information on the, the equity element of the black and brown communities? So you, you obviously talked about the 50 counties that yeah. have the highest death rate, but what is the other component of that look like? So that's something that the ACIP, right, which consists of, you know, in addition to just regular old, I don't know if you can say regular old when you say epidemiologists and experts, but uh, in addition to them, they're bioethicists who are involved in ACIP. And so we're, we're looking for their guidance about that. Um, we also have a pretty good idea in the city of Chicago and across the state of Illinois where the communities are, uh, where if you want to address the inequities uh, for black and brown communities, you know, where those locations might be. And then the doctor um, and IDPH are looking at uh, mobile, the possibility of allowing local uh, health departments to use uh, mobile uh, facilities for the distribution of vaccine. But again, we're looking for the plans from the uh, 96 of the 97 local public health departments, the 97th being Chicago, and they have uh, a separate allocation. Those plans have, uh, nearly all of them have been submitted to IDPH already, right? We're down to about eight uh, local health departments that haven't yet submitted their plans. Uh, and then they will be tasked with distributing, picking up the vaccine and distributing it within their counties. They know their counties better than anybody else. How do you describe the historic nature of this venture and, and has the state ever had to undertake anything of this magnitude before, logistically? I'm not sure I know. Uh, uh, you know, I've been in office for two years. Um, I can't tell you the entire history of the state of Illinois and its uh, distribution of, I, I can just say, I don't think at any time, even during the last pandemic, uh, there was anything quite like this, right? There wasn't a vaccine that was being uh, distributed like this and in such quick fashion, too. Uh, so I, this is unprecedented. I mean, like everything else in 2020, uh, this is unprecedented. And you know, I'm, I'm very proud. I'm very proud of, of this country, of the, of the researchers and doctors and epidemiologists and all the work that they've done. You know, I've stood up here how many times? 100 and 30 times uh, at press conferences during this year, and I've talked sometimes about my prayers, our prayers collectively for the researchers, because all of us know that we're not going to get past this without a, either an extraordinarily effective treatment, which we haven't yet seen. We've seen some good ones, but not extraordinarily effective, uh, or vaccines. And I think the prayer that we could have vaccines in relatively short order uh, seems to have been answered. And I really credit the researchers and the people who are on the front lines, the people who are experimenting, doing the science, and have done it for you know a decade up to now that has allowed this to be such a quick uh, uh, turnaround time it's for more, a vaccine. It's more allowing to get the vaccine. Is that a quicker way to get back to tier two mitigation? Yes. Into that lovely phase five we've all been dreaming of. Yes. Dr. Zeke, any advice for pregnant women, whether or not, especially pregnant health care women, should they take the uh, vaccine? No, there, there are still questions that are unanswered, and I am not the one to make the final call. We're waiting for data. That is a specific uh, group that we need to have information on in terms of pregnancy. We have to see if there were, if the FDA says that there were enough pregnant women, usually pregnant women are not included in these kind of trials. So if it turns out incidentally that somebody who got the vaccine was present, pregnant and they found out subsequently after they were enrolled, we might have data, but it might not be enough people of that category with which to make a, with which to make a decision. And so for that, the guidelines that may come out might say that they would be excluded. You know, so uh, again, much to be learned. We're also, you know, we know that for instance, uh, people, what do you do with people who've had COVID? Does that mean they don't need the vaccine? You know, so I think we've heard that, you know, if you're within three months of having the infection, we think you don't need the vaccine, but potentially if it's been more than three months, uh, you might still, and they might say it's three to six months because we have information in the literature that, you know, three months you're protected, maybe it's up to six months. So again, some answers that we're still waiting uh, from uh, both the FDA and the CDC to give us 
additional guidelines. Dr. Nzika, a number of our listeners called this morning. They want to know if there's stronger doses for certain age groups. Because when you get the flu shot, right. if you're a senior citizen, they give you a different dose that's more uh, potent. Right. Is that it's really applied to COVID? No, that's a great question. So we don't have that at this time. Uh, there is only one dose, and you know. Initially, you were, everyone is getting those same, you know, dose one and dose two look exactly equivalent. I know some people were asking if, it, if it's a different dose and then a higher dose. They're both equivalent doses, uh, and so that is what we have, and we don't have a, a, a different formulation that's for any specialized population at this point. Again, there might be further uh, updates in vaccines that will be tested again to determine if there's a different need, because we do know that seniors uh, do have... Uh, for, maybe over age 75, we know that they have a harder time making those antibodies. So that's the rationale behind the, the flu shots, which have, you know, you have a hyper, hyper flu shot, if you will, to help them boost, uh, to create that immune response. Do you know how long it's gonna take 1A to get before we move on to 1B? I mean, the healthcare workers, the, the long-term yeah. residents, how long that's gonna take? Yeah, so 1A alone, uh, again, we wanna try to get that done uh, I mean, obviously, as soon as possible, it's going to be probably limited by the vaccine uh, allocation that we get. Uh, so, and it depends if that second vaccine makes it through uh, the FDA approval, because then that gives us more vaccine to be working with. So, and then of course, it depends on the willingness uh, of the people who are in the one A to to get it. But in terms of getting it to everyone who wants it, you know, I'm hoping we can get through that within you know four weeks, a month or so and then get to 1B, which is a much larger group, I think, and it's gonna take some, a considerable amount of time. And it will take and many, then, many months, months, I might add. I mean, I, I uh, to get, you know, when you get beyond 1A, um, and, uh, uh, and, I, and I wouldn't even say, for me anyway, when I read the data, and I don't, I would defer to the doctor, but I will say that I wouldn't put a time uh, limit on it, because it's very hard to tell. We don't know when Moderna, is going to be approved. We don't know when Pfizer is going to be approved. We know what the dates are for the meetings, and we hope December 10th is the date for Pfizer. We hope that a week later, 10 days later, uh, Moderna might be approved. And if, 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 then you get a certain number of the manufactured vaccines that they've already manufactured in hope that it will be approved. <laughs> And so, yeah, so I'm sorry. So, so the, the amounts of vaccine that are available are really dependent on a lot of things that are completely out of our control. Doesn't it help that the vaccine's being stored in Kenosha, some of it already? Yes, I mean, of course, I, although I, you know, it's not like we don't have mass transit and, you know, and, and uh, airports and airplanes that can deliver things relatively quickly. But yes, of course, um, having, uh, knowing that there's a, a, a warehouse near Kenosha, as I understand, uh, that, that might be holding Pfizer vaccine is uh, great great news for all of us. Can I ask you about cannabis sales? Uh, the revenue is booming. Uh, is this roughly what you expected? Uh, I don't know that we knew exactly what to expect. I mean, you know, we've made projections early on. Uh, it appears to me that this exceeds uh, many of the projections that were made uh, early on. But, um, but uh, you know, but the industry is doing well. There's much more that needs to be done to build out the industry, as you know, uh, and we're going to continue to to make sure that that happens. And back to part two the, of that question, the industry says the state is leaving a lot of money on the yeah. table. I heard that. Yeah. Be, because of refusal to allow the companies to move medical dispensaries to well, sell. Why not allow this, and are you open to discussion? Always open to discussion, but, but understand that uh, there was a bill back in May that would have allowed that. The General Assembly did not take that bill up. Uh, the uh, bill also would have clarified some of the rules around um, uh, social equity licenses. I want to speed up making sure that the social equity licenses get out there. Um, and I have worked with the Black Caucus to make sure that, that we're doing that as expeditiously as possible. Um, but, you know, those things would go together, the expansion of the medical provider's ability to have a second location. I know everybody would say, well, we're leaving money on the table. Why not give out all the licenses? Well, you, as you know, there are reasons why the General Assembly wrote a bill that has, a, you know, ratable amounts over the course of the next several years uh, as they roll out the industry. And I think they've done it well, I might add. One from Mark about. Maxwell, he's asked me to ask you, your office says the USVA offered an infection control expert to the LaSalle Veterans Home on November 9th. 
why did she it only was now just arrive it was on november site 19 on, not 19 either way why did she not arrive on site on november 30th what took so long to implement that help i'm sorry you're talking about dph uh, uh, can you uh, just explain no, it says the usba offered an infection control ah, the usba so yeah let me let me uh, respond to that because i know that that uh, their congressman kinzinger is out there uh pushing that story yeah honestly i'm i'm unclear uh, i don't think anybody's clear about what the congressman is referring to because um, the dva and the u.s uh, veterans administration have been in regular communication from the very beginning here uh, starting when there was an outbreak and there's been a good working relationship between those two organizations from the outset uh, the usva offered uh, the state help with ppe and infection control we took them up on it um, and to, on both of those offers. Uh, and at the end of the month, uh, they offered a, a consultant to come in and review protocols, uh, at the end of last month, I might add, um, uh, to review protocols at, at not just the LaSalle home, but all of our homes, and we took them up on that as well. In fact, more so, we asked them for assistance uh, in all of our homes, and they've been providing it. So, I mean, I would say, it is funny to me that the congressman is attacking uh, on this point when he voted against funding for our state veterans' homes. And that would have been very helpful to us in keeping them safe. All right, the we got to get online. You have one more, Marianne. All right, did the on site infection control expert have COVID and that's why she was late or he or she was late in arriving? I haven't heard anything like that. No. All right, that's the question. Uh, John O'Connor, the AP. For Respectfully, I understand who investigates price gouging. My question was, where are the referrals to the AG you promised? How can the AG staff investigate price gouging if the buyer doesn't alert them to it? Who on your staff is lead on this? Well, I, I want to just maybe we need to level set, uh, John, because I know you asked this question a little bit yesterday. Um, we did the work on the front end. You know, we had offers coming in to sell uh, different kinds of PPE, particularly masks on the front end and they were certainly high prices. Those were, some of those prices that were being offered to us were uh, higher than others. Uh, but all of them, or most of them rather, were in line with what other states were being offered as well. So when we saw $5, a $6, uh, a $7 N95 mask, um, you also heard Governor Cuomo talking about the fact that that's what it was costing uh, New York, and that's what it was costing Ohio, and that's what it was costing other states, and that's one of the consequences of having no national strategy and, and having not invoked the Defense Production Act, uh, is that the, the market price, which is not uh, defined as a gouging price, a market price is whatever the market will bear, the market price went up. Uh, that was shocking to everybody because when you're paying $5 for something that a year ago, sorry, a year earlier would have cost you or even months earlier would have cost only maybe 95 cents. Um, just surprising to everybody. Where there was price gouging, and we had, you know, we saw an instance of this where, uh, you know, there was an offer to us at a ridiculously high price uh, at a moment when we needed an N95 masks, but, um, and there was fraud involved in that uh, situation, and we did refer that situation uh, not just to the AG and to the ISP, but also to the federal government. Um, indeed, the federal government was helping us to monitor for those kinds of fraudulent situations. So um, there was a lot going on in that market, and wherever we saw anything, if we saw something that we could identify as price gouging, we referred it. You heard me talk about it here because I wanted to make sure that anybody that was out there that was thinking about price gouging the state of Illinois would know that we would send it to the authorities. Uh, there are 200,000 fraudulent IDS unemployment claims, this is from Gretchen, mm -hmm. uh, that have been filed. Why is this happening when there is a massive backup? Would you consider holding a special session to discuss IDS backups and the cause of more than 200,000 fraudulent unemployment claims? So I can tell you that uh, there are massive fraudulent unemployment cr claims because there, uh, you know, because uh, there are identities that have been stolen uh, in every state uh, and applications made on behalf of those people. I know people that that's happened to. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's something that, you know, whenever a, uh, a crook uh, sees an opportunity, uh, they're going to come forward. Some of these folks have 
uh, are people who have hacked into, let's say, Experian uh, or a number of retailers' systems, stolen millions of identities, uh, and then they hold on to them for some long period of time, uh, not using them so that they can sort of spring them at the right moment. So that's one of the causes of uh, the fraud. And as to hearings about IDES, uh, we've been very transparent, happy to, to res we've been at hearings, we've had our IDES director at hearings uh, to respond to uh, the uh, General Assembly, working groups of the General Assembly. Uh, there's a commission, as you know, that oversees uh, the work uh, in response to the pandemic. Um, and so we've responded to that by sending our IDES folks. Uh, but I also want to point out that uh, Illinois is not unusual in this regard, that literally nearly every state has had not only massive amounts of fraud, but huge delays that have occurred uh, as a result of the massive influx of applications for unemployment. Um, you, can, you, know, you can see there are plenty of articles about those many other states. Indeed, I think it's 47 states uh, that have reported uh, you know, mass, massive delays by weeks. Uh, Illinois is, you know, maybe in the middle of the pack uh, in terms of uh, its responsiveness, but, you know, to dealing with this. Uh, and we're trying very hard to overcome uh, backlogs that exist, but we're constantly overcoming that backlog, just to know. so you know. There are uh, callback systems and other systems that have been put in place over the course of the last six months that are really helping us to make sure that people get their unemployment on time. Dave Dahl, WTAX. You recently talked about Midwest governors, and now the governor of Ohio is facing possible impeachment because of orders similar to yours. How close are you to being impeached? <laughs> is that a real question? Um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Um, I uh, look. Um, uh, you know, I have a strong approval rating in the state. I think I've done a good job. Um, I know that there are people who run around every day trying to file lawsuits. Of the snake oil salesman that we've talked about before, um, and uh, you know, trying to gin up uh, opposition to our effort to fight COVID-19. Um, and all I can say is that we're doing the right thing. The courts have affirmed the things that we're doing. Uh, that the best experts in the country are affirming the kinds of mitigations that we've put in place. Um, so I, I don't know what to say. I, t I have talked to the governor of Ohio. Uh, and the other governors in the Midwest, and um, we have shared best ideas with one another. I have to say that we may be on the opposite uh, sides of the aisle, uh, Governor DeWine and I, but, um, but he, has, um, you know, he has had good ideas, implemented them. I think he's been one of the leaders. So I'm sure there are people who don't like him and are trying to remove him from office, mostly in his own party. Uh, Jordan Elder, WICS. Region 3 has the lowest percentage of available ICU beds across the state right now, and only 20 ICU beds are available as of yesterday. Right. They covered 18 counties in that region. Will the state get involved if beds run out, especially with a post-Thanksgiving surge possibly on the way? In many ways, we already are um, involved. That is to say, with every hospital, we um, are being responsive to them. They call us for help when they need it of any sort, um, you know, we're going to continue to monitor those ICU beds. Thank goodness, if you look at the numbers, and I look at them every day, um, the ICU numbers are coming down mildly across the state. Um, the hospital beds overall are, have come down about 15% off of the peak so far. I'm not saying we should celebrate anything because we still have to get through this period that people have talked about as a surge upon a surge. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm always hopeful when I see the, the numbers going the right direction. Uh, Marty Pike at the Daily Herald, what if, what if significant numbers refuse to get the vaccines? Will that endanger the rest of the population? You know, I'd rather defer to the doctor about this because it's a question about herd immunity, I think. And, yeah, oh, sorry. I think I spoke about this. Obviously, um, it's, a, it's a collective approach. All of this all of the efforts that have been needed to control this pandemic have been a collective, uh, a collective response that's been needed. Uh, we know that if you wear a mask, that's great, but if 
two people interacting uh, wear a mask, that's much better. Uh, if everyone is wearing a mask, that's obviously much better. There's a similar concept with the, with the vaccination. If I'm in a group of 20 and 10 people have not been vaccinated, uh, if I'm one of them, then I have, if I'm infected, I have the ability to infect those other nine people that similarly are not vaccinated. Uh, but if all 19, if 19 other people in my 20 person circle, and of course we're not supposed to be in groups of 20, uh, then all then none of those people are susceptible. And so even if I do have the infection, I can't transmit it to anyone. So every single person that gets vaccinated helps us get closer to a point where our community is safer. Uh, every single one helps. The more we get, the better we are, the less virus can move around because it's struggling to find anybody to infect. And so that's the concept. We think, we're not sure about this percentage in terms of how many you need. Uh, we've heard 80 percent, we've heard 70 percent. We won't actually even know until we see the transmission really subside to say that, oh, you needed this percent, oh, you need that percent. So it's not a number that we can say definitively now. We just want to get as many people vaccinated. And when we get there, we'll obviously know as the transmission spread decreases decreases and decreases. Kelly Bauer of Block Club for Governor Pritzker. There's a surge of new cases, but the jail population has remained higher than it was in the spring. What are we doing to protect incarcerated and detained people? Why isn't there a more visible push for release? Um, just so I understand it, I think that when you say the jail population, I don't know if she's including the prison population in that. I think that is not the case, I might add. Prison population is down. Um, the jail population actually has come down significantly over the last couple of months as we have transferred more uh, uh, inmates, potential inmates, from uh, jail to prison. Uh, and so that population has come down over the last couple of months. So I, I think she's what referring to something before March as compared to today. Remember, you don't forget that the court systems have been, you know, roughly speaking, shut down at least for a, quite a number of months. So there were people who no doubt were waiting, awaiting their court appearances, uh, who unfortunately were in jail during that time. Uh, and so I, I feel badly about that. But I think overall, um, you know, the population has come down and, and that's helped to manage COVID-19 better. Samantha Smiley is asking when the state plans to prioritize teachers on the list. Well, again, we're, you know, the ACIP committee is uh, meeting and, and uh, producing recommendations for everybody. Uh, certainly, you know, after the, you know, kind of phase 1A uh, and potentially after phase 1B, you know, we'll start to see other very essential uh, populations like teachers uh, that'll be addressed. Can Dr. Zike, this is from Jim Leach at WMIY, can Dr. Zike address the side effects of the vaccine? Will it cause symptoms that can sideline people? And how will that impact already overworked medical staff? Yeah. Um, that is a really important question. Uh, and as the FDA releases the data and the information that will allow us to see the percentages of people that report a significant reaction. I think I've heard 10 to 15 percent of people have a significant reaction uh, that can last maybe even up to nearly 24 hours. So we need that information obviously so that as we're moving forward, especially with our uh, both our long-term care population and with our uh, health care workers that we plan that and understand that so that we don't have a situation where uh, a bunch of people that we need to be in the hospital all need to take a day off subsequent to that vaccine. So again, that is information that we will be getting from the FDA uh, hopefully next week uh, with that December 10th meeting. And so that is important information that we need to get out so that there can be appropriate planning to make sure that we protect uh, the uh, healthcare force so that we don't have too many people out at the same time. Dan Petrella at the Tribune, state data shows 480 deaths in the past week tied to long-term care facilities. That's the highest weekly death total of the pandemic and nearly double from the week before. What more can be done to protect this vulnerable population before vaccination? Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is frankly the same challenge that exists in all the other populations um, and even more so uh, when we are at the highest levels of the pandemic. Um, this is, you know, this surge has been much higher than even the last surge uh, was uh, back in the, in the spring. Um, 
there is a great deal that has been done. We've shut down, for example, you remember that although long-term care facilities had been completely shut down to outside visitors, uh, that uh, uh, we opened it up for outside visiting uh, for a period of time, and now, uh, out, now we no longer have the uh, that open for people to have outside visit, sorry, outdoors is what I meant by outside, by outside visitors. Um, and so that's one thing that's been done. Certainly infection control is better uh, overall now than it was at the very beginning because there's a greater understanding of what needs to be done. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that we do to try to protect people in long-term care facilities. Also, I'd remind you that we weren't able back in the spring to uh, test everybody or test the staff on a regular basis or the or the residents actually now we're testing staff once a week uh, and uh, we're providing the supplies for all the the uh, long-term care facilities to do it themselves uh, and wherever there's an outbreak we're testing everybody in the facility all residents at that time to see if there's an outbreak among the residents and whether there needs to be segregation of people who have COVID and uh, John at the Tribune is asking what you're going to do to prevent wealthy and connected people from getting ahead of other people in line. Well, the first thing we've done is that we've, we've set parameters. We are setting parameters. ACIP is helping with that uh, for who should get the vaccine. And then we're requiring all of the 96 local public health departments to follow those parameters with a plan that gets submitted to IDPH and then approved uh, and then the, they're responsible for distributing the vaccine to the locations, to the, the providers that will uh, administer it to the communities that are in each phase as it's laid out. Uh, so, you know, that's the most important thing and I guess, you know, I, I would add on top of that that, um, uh, you know, that we want it, We have to move through this first phase of the uh, uh, vaccine distribution uh, to make sure that we're covering the uh, healthcare workers and long-term care facility uh, workers and residents. Uh, you know, certainly before it would ever get to any broader population. So we're prioritizing. All right, Greg Hines at Cranes will be our last one. Is Chicago not only getting its distribution of vaccine doses directly from the feds, but also a share of the state's overall 109? Probably just should explain the breakdown. Yeah. Sure. Um, so Chicago has about 21% of the population of the state in the city of Chicago. And so the federal government is sending about 21% of the 109,000 that come to the state of Illinois. They, they receive that directly. It's about 23,000. Uh, and uh, the state, the rest of the state and the state SNS gets the other 86,000 of those. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Jordan, do you have the 10 hospital locations? Yeah, I'm going to send you guys. I have the PowerPoint and it had it on there. I just don't think you guys can see it. So I'll send it as soon as I get back to my desk. <laughs> Oh, so <laughs> funny. Actually, I actually just came there and I already told them not to lock me out today. I was like, I have to keep up with like, you you know, know, my reputation so I can't be locked out. Because seven's going to stay here. Sure, sure, sure. Oh, yeah. It shouldn't be too bad. I already got it. I, already, I downloaded your graphics too. Oh, no. You didn't? No, we did not.